It's the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. But it's not just any Ross Tucker Football Podcast. I would never do that to you. It's actually a Tuckheads Tuesday. What does that mean? It means we're doing the power rankings tomorrow for two reasons. Number one, Brian's travel schedule. And number two, I couldn't take it anymore. I had to talk with Dean Blandino. I am so tired of all of the flags. I'm so tired of all of the clear points of emphasis that they didn't tell us about before the season. I had to talk to former NFL VP of officiating Dean Blandino, who now works for Fox. You guys all know him. He's on TV all the time. We'll get to Dean momentarily because I had to get to the bottom of it. For you guys, for the Tuckheads, you deserve it. We all deserve to know what the heck is going on with our favorite sport. You guys know the drill, whether it comes to spread the word winner at Ross Tucker NFL at Ross Tucker Pod. Sponsor confirmation, email winner. I still have four Maddens to give away. Four more Maddens. You know how to get one if you want it. And then the YouTube shout out, youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. Patrons of the day, Debbie Bryant and Bill Surrey. Patreon.com slash RT Media. That is where it's at. If you want to get all the even money bets, we'll have even money recorded 2 p.m. Eastern time today. I know you love the even money bets. You get them in black and white at patreon.com slash RT Media as long as you become a Tuckheads member. It's Big Show time. The Big Show. All right, I already mentioned um, uh, one of my favorite guys to talk to in the NFL because he's so knowledgeable about something, quite frankly, that no matter how much time I put into it, and I try so hard, Dean. I do college games. I do NFL games. I review the rules before every game. I've got all kinds of notes. There are still, once a game, something comes up a lot of times that I'm not 100% sure of, which is why I think it's terrific that more and more networks have people like you there to clarify, because we can't be an expert in everything. Well, you can. I know you, you're you pretty close. You're pretty close to an expert in everything. But officiating, we still need a couple of other people to help. Um, but it, it's true. I mean, I'll, I really feel like the value that, that people like myself, Mike Pereira, others, Gene Steratore, that we provide, yeah, we might go on camera once a game and, and, and clarify something, but we're talking to the producers in the truck throughout the game on, on anything rules or officiating related, and then they can relay that directly to the on-air talent. And then the on-air talent can just reiterate that. And then we're not misquoting a rule. We're not, we're not kind of sending the fans down the wrong path. And that happens. I mean, that can happen 25 times a game. So that's really, I think, where the value. Because like you said, there's always something that comes up. Even as someone like me that spent my entire career in officiating, there's plays. There's plays like Thursday night that come up that you haven't seen before that you have to take a step back and kind of and kind of break it down a little bit. Did you know, Dean, did you know that you're allowed to have two forward kicks? I did. I did know that because I've spent so much time with special teams coaches. In my time at the NFL, I would talk to special teams coaches every day, and they're in, you know this, right, from playing in the league, they're always thinking of different things. They're always trying to come up with these exotic plays and and so, you know, we always talked about, hey, if the punt is blocked, can my guy kick it again? What can he do? Can he pass it? Can he run? So it's a, it's a unique play. It doesn't happen very often, but that's something those special teams coaches, you know, we, we've definitely talked about it before. All right. So, Dean, I, I want you to pretend like you're the commissioner or you are in charge of everything. You're in charge of the football world for a second, okay? Okay. I haven't seen the latest data to see if there are more flags being thrown this year than the last few years. Uh, You probably know. Do you know, Dean? Well, yeah, there's more. I think what we're seeing this year, last year, fouls were down significantly, like historically low. Like we hadn't seen numbers like that since the early 70s. 
And, uh, and, and so, you know, 12, 12 and a half a game. And this year we're seeing it more back towards the, the norms, right? 15, 16 a game. So I don't know if that's just, we were, we, we got, we got attuned to kind of an, an accustomed to, you know, not a lot of fouls a game last year. And now we're back to where it used to be. And we kind of just forgot and, uh, and it feels like more. Um, I think there've been some games like obviously Sunday night. Yeah. That, that's an outlier, right? There were 24, 25 fouls. You don't see that very often. Um, so it, it feels even, even more, but it, it really is kind of where the, the historical norms have been right around 15, 16 a game. Okay. So what I've never understood, Dean, I, I am totally fine. If it's an obvious foul, like the guy tackles him and it's defensive pass interference. The guy tackles him, it's offensive holding or whatever, right? Sure. I, I am totally fine with throwing that flag. They need to throw that flag. Where I get especially frustrated, and it felt like last year they did a better job of this. I don't know what happened because that's too significant, Dean. Like to go from 12, 12 and a half back to 15 or 16. Either they told him something before the season last year. They said, hey, let's get these games done with. Don't be throwing the flag all the time. Or this year they said, hey, look for this, this, and this. Cause I'll, I'll get into that because there's a couple, I think, that there are points of emphasis that they didn't tell us about, but it seems clear to me. I guess I feel like if I were the commissioner, if I was in charge, I would say to whoever's in charge, whether it's Walt Coleman or Troy Vincent, whoever, you, you tell me who's in charge. I would say, listen, nobody wants the fouls. Nobody wants the flags. Nobody wants the stoppages. So when in doubt, don't throw the flag. Because I think what's frustrating for me, Dean, we're seeing a bunch of ticky-tack fouls and flags being thrown on questionable holding, questionable roughing the passer, some questionable pass interference. I just don't understand who at the league office thinks it's a good idea to throw the flag in those situations? Yeah, look, and you're, I agree with you 100%. And that's, that's basically the messaging. As long as I've been involved in officiating, it's, it's not a when in doubt, throw the flag standard. It used to be years ago when, when it came to player safety, I remember them used to say air on the side of safety, air on the side of safety. And I remember Jack Del Rio you know, I said that one time in a, in a competition committee meeting and Jack's a pretty big dude and he and he got fired up and I was like, OK, I'm not going to say that anymore in front of you, Jack. It's fine. But but we kind of went to look, you've got to you've got to protect the players. You've got to protect them from unnecessary risk. So you got to strictly enforce player safety fouls, but you have to see the entire action. You can't. And if there's a question in your mind, don't throw the flag, see the entire action. And you just said it. There are fouls that need to be called because if you don't, if you have a team that's going to be aggressive, that's going to push the envelope and another team that's going to play by the rules, the team that's pushing the envelope is going to gain an advantage if you don't throw a flag. So you got to get the calls you need to make. And then there are these calls that, yeah, maybe you could call it. It's technical. I could look in the rule book and maybe justify it. The ticky tack ones. You want to stay away from that. And it's felt more, ticky tack this year compared to last year i think last year was they were letting too much go but but i think there's a there's a sweet spot where it's calling the the ones you need to get the ones that you can see the whole action stay away from being overly technical um and and you know let the let the flow of the game and everything don't unnecessarily stop the game and, and i think we can get there it just feels like the first couple of weeks we're, we're not there yet okay so I know there's a competition committee and then there's an officiating department and then obviously there's the owners and the commissioner. So I guess let's start with this. Who gives the officials their marching orders? In other words, I understand the competition committee can put new rules in or remove rules or whatever. And that's made up of coaches and executives and the owners. I get that. But something had to happen to go from 12 or 12 and a half back up to 15 or 16. Like, who is ultimately in charge of the officiating department? It's Troy Vincent, right? Well, so Troy oversees all of football operations and officiating falls under Troy. But Troy isn't really 
hands-on in terms of officiating mechanics or evaluations during the season. So the way it works is you have a competition committee that works with a coaches subcommittee. They, they review everything. They review all the player safety issues, sportsmanship issues. They look at competitive um, issues and they'll come up with, you know, a set of rules changes for the owners to vote on. They'll come up with points of emphasis right this year, taunting. We've been talking about taunting as a point of emphasis. They'll come up with, with all of these things, put it into a report. The owners see everything. Everything gets passed through that, that, that committee and that membership group. Um, rules changes get passed, get voted on. They either get passed or they, or they, they don't. And then the points of emphasis get a blessing. And then it's on the officiating department, the officiating leadership. So this year, right, it's Perry Fuel, who was a coach in the NFL for a long time. Walt Anderson, who was a referee in the league for a long time. They're, they're in charge. They have officiating supervisors who are former officials that evaluate all of the on-field officials. So it's up to them to then implement these points of emphasis, these rules changes. And it's really important because there's an evaluation system and officials get graded on every game, every call. And that evaluation system really drives behavior and performance. Because if I'm an official and I go work a game and I throw six flags and they're all graded correctly, then what the league is telling me, my leadership team is telling me, good calls, keep calling that. If four of those are graded incorrectly, they're telling me, don't throw those flags again. So how those officials are evaluated on these calls that we're seeing is really, really important to, to performance going forward. Okay. So that, that, that's important. So really it sounds to me like there's a couple of things that could happen, right? So number one, the guys grading them and or Walt Anderson, I think I said Walt Coleman, Walt Anderson and Perry fuel, they could either, have a memo or they could just start to say to guys, I wouldn't have called that there. Yeah. I wouldn't have called that there and downgrade them. I'm assuming the commissioner could say something to Perry fuel and Walt Anderson or Troy or someone could say, guys, what are we doing here? When you're giving these guys grades, you need to let them know that if it's ticky tack, they should not be throwing the flag. There still is some hierarchy I mean, Walt Anderson and Perry Fuel still have bosses sure. that could say to them, hey, when you're grading these guys out, I don't want them getting good grades for throwing the flags on very questionable penalties. I think everybody, Dean, wants them to let them play a little bit more. Yeah, and, and certainly, you know, and I had those conversations when I was there with Troy or Roger about that. Um, and, and they're not going to get into the individual, like that call was incorrect, but from a big picture perspective, absolutely. Hey, we're calling fouls seem to be up. What are the numbers? Where are we, what, what fouls are up this year? Is it pass interference? Is it rough in the passer? Let's take a look. What is the standard? You have those conversations and, and you also, you have training teams that go out to all of the officials and that messaging is so important because again, you're, you're either going to, you're going to reinforce behavior or you're going to try to you're going to try to decentivize if I say hey this is not a foul you know for me I would you know I would show that Frank Clark hit on Josh Allen I would say listen guys this is not a foul this is not not what we want this is not a lift and a drive that type of thing so all of the referees can see that and they can say okay going forward we don't want to call that versus an obvious foul a clear foul say yeah this is pass interference so so in that though that's happening um, throughout the season. And again, it, it comes down to, you know, what is the standard? How are they being evaluated? And then how are the officials themselves then executing that? Because, you know, we get the benefit of slow motion replay. We get the benefit of, of multiple angles and they get to see it once in, you know, at full speed. So there's that human element as well. Um, that, that is all part of it. So there's two, fouls I feel like are clear points of emphasis this year that they didn't tell us about you know I, I'm on all those meetings you know all those zoom calls before the, I think I was on three of them and it, it was very repetitive because one was for preseason games one was for Westwood one was for whatever they didn't say anything Dean about an eligible man downfield yeah but I think the Eagles themselves have been called for five or six it's taken at least two touchdowns off the board. 
it seems clear that an eligible man downfield is a point of emphasis this year, but they didn't tell anybody. So number one, what exactly is the rule? And number two, do they have points of emphasis that they don't tell us in the in the broadcast production meetings are going to be points of emphasis? Yeah, you, that does happen. There are things that happen during the season where you, you see a trend. Hey, we're seeing linemen downfield over and over and over. And a lot of times that comes from coaches. Coaches can, can send in questions about their game and they may send in, you know, hey, here's eight plays where the Eagles had linemen downfield or whichever team it is. So that can certainly happen. You know, and, and so what the rule is, and, and we're seeing more and more of this because of all the RPOs and everything else, is the linemen, offensive linemen, your interior five, you can't be more than a yard beyond the line of scrimmage until the pass is thrown. Now, if you're engaged in a block, you initiate a block within a yard, you can maintain that, that contact. But if you're just going downfield, you can't be more than a yard um, until the ball is released, if it's a forward pass. And, and the way that's officiated is you, you really want to see that lineman at two yards because you don't want to be overly technical. It's the entire body. You don't. So, so once they get to two and then the ball is released, then you need to drop the flag. This happens way more than it's actually called because of, you know, like I said, all the RPOs that are in the game. But it does feel like this was something the officiating department said we have to really focus on and we have to call this. And, and it feels like the numbers are up this year. And uh, it is something that really, I agree, it wasn't discussed during the offseason. This is something that might have come came up during the preseason or even, you know, the first two weeks of the year. So just to clarify a couple of things. So first of all, if you're engaged with a, a line of scrimmage player, and you're driving them back, and then you get disengaged. Or what if a linebacker comes up? What if a linebacker comes up and meets you at one and a half yards, so to speak? And you're and you're in contact, and you and you maintain that contact until the ball's released. You're good. If you're at, if you're at three, if you start at one, engage. You drive to three, and then disengage, and the ball hasn't thrown, hasn't been thrown by rule. That's a foul. Even if it's not you disengaging, it's the other guy disengaging. It's, it's yeah, the defender it disengaging. Yeah, it doesn't. The rule doesn't specify. And again, this rule, you think about the college rule. The college rule is three yards. And if the pass is thrown behind the line of scrimmage, you can be, doesn't matter. There's no, there's no limit, no restriction. And this is something, and in my time, a lot of the defensive coaches, it's, a, it's not wanting to turn into the college game or – you know, you want to you want to see the the deep passing game, throwing the ball downfield. You don't want to just see a whole bunch of screens and, and and those types of plays. So there is some hesitancy to go to you know allow the lineman downfield further like the colleges do. Uh, but but again, it happens more than it's called. That, that I know that for certain just from watching tape. The other thing I feel like they're certainly calling more offensive pass interference this year, Dean, on the uh, on the picks and the rubs, yeah. whatever you want to call it. What what is the rule there? Yeah, and, and I know the Eagles. I just from watching the Eagles games on Fox, they unbelievable. Fired, like right? three or four what, touchdowns. Three, it's three crazy. Or four touchdowns. I know, crazy. So it's again, it's a yard, and, and you can you can block with a yard. So on the outside, if you've got a receiver, right, you've got to stay within a yard. You can't you can't initiate within a yard and then drive beyond. Only the the ineligible lineman can do that. So it really comes down to, and, and I've had conversations with, with you know, people at the Eagles about this in the, in the offseason and, and during the season. You know, it comes down to the route running posture, pass ca pass catching posture versus blocking posture. And because it's so, because a lot of times the defender's initiating contact within five and the receiver's just trying to get off that contact. But if now if you turn into that defender and you're presenting a, a blocking posture, and now you drive into that defender and you're more than a yard downfield. And now that other, that second receiver cuts underneath, that's when you're going to get the flag. So if you run a route and you're in a pass catching posture, there can be contact, um, you know, beyond a yard. But if you're in, if you're blocking or you're setting a pick and you're initiating that contact with that defender, you know, you don't, you don't set your, you know, your, if you've got position on the field and you've established yourself there, um, that's one thing. The defender's got to go through you or over you or under you. 
but but you can't you can't set like a moving pick and at the last second try to get out of the way and create some contact. That would be a foul more than a yard downfield before the ball is caught. You got to check out this man on social media at Dean Blandino. Clearly, he is fantastic. Awesome stuff, Dean. This is exactly what I wanted, especially since I'm calling the Eagles Bucks game Thursday night for Westwood one and the Eagles get two of both of those penalties every game. <laughs> this was, this is part, part prep for me and part, I just wanted a better understanding of just the process in general. Sunday night was not, not a good product for the NFL. And I feel like that's happened uh, too many times this year. Yeah. Sunday night, those are, and those are hopefully one-off games where there's a ton of stuff going on. And again, in an ideal world, it's the two teams that decide how many fouls there are and the officials are just calling that, you know, what's presented to them. Sometimes that's not always the case. And I think, I think they'll figure it out and then we'll get away from being overly technical and, and hopefully we won't have games like that going forward. Awesome. Thanks so much. Check him out at Dean Blandino. So, you know, whatever Dean is up to. Thanks Dean. All right, Ross. Thanks. Gosh, I love when I really want to get a guest and I get him, and it's awesome. Just like I love, deodorant that my wife loves let me just tell you it matters a lot i don't know why women have the strongest sense of smell in the world my wife can smell something from like a mile away i can't smell my own armpits i can't smell my own body odor although i wish i could because native has the best deodorant and body wash in amazing scents like coconut and vanilla, citrus and herbal musk, or my wife's favorite, lavender and rose, and more. You can even build your own personalized product bundles at Native. They've got sunscreen now, Native's legendary aluminum-free deodorant, plus they got body wash, toothpaste, mineral-based sunscreen. They got everything now. Stay fresh, stay clean. So fresh and so clean, clean. Stay fresh, stay clean with Native by going to nativedeo.com slash Ross or use promo code Ross at checkout and get 20% off your first order. This is a good Madden winner here too. That's nativedeo.com slash Ross or just use promo code Ross at checkout for 20% off your first order. Tux Takes. Good morning, Ross. We got huge news about John Gruden. We'll get to that in a second, of course. Let's first talk about Monday Night Football. Ravens came back to beat the Colts 31-25 in overtime. Crazy game. Absolutely crazy game. I cannot believe the Colts lost that game. Uh, they had so many big plays. They were the better team for so long. But that's the way the Ravens play. The Ravens just keep playing. And you got to close out games in the NFL. I mean, the Colts had that 76-yard touchdown on a screen pass to start the game to Jonathan Taylor. They were moving the ball again. Then Adafe Owe uh, hit Carson Wentz from behind who fumbled. Wentz does that too often. I mean, that Wentz played a really good game. But that fumble right there, that would have been at least a field goal. Would have been the difference in the game. You cannot have red zone turnovers. Can't do it. I thought the Colts defense in general did a pretty good job in the first half, maybe even the first three quarters against Lamar and the Ravens, although Lamar didn't even have the ball very often. And then you think about the second half, you think, no, oh, okay, maybe now the Ravens will make a comeback. Nope. Michael Pittman has an incredible touchdown where he mossed Averett for the Ravens. That was awesome. Then they strip Lamar Jackson on like the two-yard line. Darius Leonard picks it up. He pitches it back to Isaiah Rogers. It was a touchdown. They said it was a forward lateral. I could have talked to Dean about that one, but I already know why they do that. It's where the ball was when it was lateral and where the ball is when it's caught. It's like a science thing. Anyway, point is, is the Colts scored a touchdown anyway. So on that drive, so I think it was Taylor again. So that rule didn't end up hurting them. But then the Colts did all the things that you can't do if you want to win a game. They missed an extra point. They went for two to try to make up for it. 
and didn't get it. That was a poor decision in my mind to go for two there. I, I don't think you need to chase those points that early. Then they had a field goal blocked by Calais Campbell that would have put the game away, and then they still would have won the game late, but they missed a field goal. It is unbelievable, unbelievable, all of the things that had to come together, all the things that had to happen for the Colts to lose that game, including Lamar Jackson being simply incredible. 37 of 42? Are you kidding me? 37 of 42. 442 yards, three touchdowns, and 14 rushes for 62 yards. Unbelievable. I mean, Wentz himself, Wentz was 25 of 35, 402 yards, two touchdowns. The Colts lost anyway. Kudos to Mark Andrews, who had about a zillion touchdowns and two-point conversions. That 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 was almost, a, I would say, an incredible choke job by the Colts. And a great effort by the Ravens, but wow, Colts, wow. Tux takes. Let's get to the Raiders and John Gruden. Uh, they officially part ways after more emails were leaked to the New York Times that included tirades against gays, women, concussion safety in the NFL and more. Yeah, I, a couple thoughts here. Number one, it's very disappointing that Gruden feels that way about all the different things he emailed about. And I think we all know that it's just, um, I don't know how to describe it. it, almost seems prehistoric. You know, it almost seems like how people used to act or talk, you know, some people at least 20, 30, 40 years ago. So what I was going to say is it's disappointing enough that he feels that way. But the sheer arrogance and stupidity to then put it in emails, I mean, you've got to be kidding me. Now, I think there's a lot more that's going to come out about this, Bri, because they went through 650,000 emails in this workplace uh, you know, investigation in the Washington football team. And the only thing we hear about, the only thing that gets leaked are John Gruden emails when he was working for ESPN to Bruce Allen, who was working for Washington at the time. That's, um, it, it makes it feel like somebody out there, you know, specifically wanted Gruden gone when they saw these emails. The investigation wasn't even into John Gruden. It was in the Washington football team and their workplace environment. Now, I guess, you know, Bruce Allen was in charge of it. And so his emails are fair game, even though he doesn't even work there anymore. It's kind of crazy, uh, the whole thing. And um, it's just very disappointing on so many levels and probably kiboshes the entire Raiders season. And not that there's an easy segue here, Bry. So I'll just tell you, overcoming the odds, rewriting the playbook, delivering under pressure. The MVPs of small business lead their teams to victory all year long. Visa is proud to provide playmakers everywhere with more tools to help grow their business and help them achieve even greater success. Because the more people we can empower, the more we all win. Visa, a network working for everyone. Tux Takes. Some other news include Steelers wide receiver Juju Smith-Schuster, Lions wide receiver Quintez Cephas, and Cardinals tight end Max Williams all looking like they're done for the season with various injuries. Schuster had a bad shoulder, and that might be a cautionary tale. I mean, Juju was a free agent last year, signed back with the Steelers on a one-year deal. Now he plays in five games, does okay, has a season-ending shoulder injury. We'll see what his market's like. Some of the guys argue that getting hurt doesn't affect you. We'll see if that's the case for Juju. Cephas was a real bright spot for the Lions. Fractured collarbone. We'll see if he can get back later in the year. 
I think I mentioned the Max Williams injury earlier or yesterday. That was really tough to take. That that was a bad injury. Tux takes. And some other uh, other injuries include Niners uh, uh, quarterback Trey Lance suffering a sprained knee. Clyde edwards helaire spraining his MCL. Texans left tackle Laramie Tunsil tearing the UCL ligament in his thumb. And the Bengals are putting running back Samaj P. Ryan and guard Jackson Carmen on the COVID list. So not good for the Chiefs because they're obviously not playing great. Now they lose Edwards Elaire for a few weeks. Trey Lance played the whole game. It kind of came out of nowhere that he suffered this sprained knee, although the Niners have a bye this week. So he'll be able to get that thing rested and healed up. It sounds like it's only a week or two injury. Not good for the Bengals that Jackson Carmen's on the COVID list. They were playing okay on the offensive line. He was their right guard, the rookie from Clemson. And then Laramie Tunsil, the point I would make about this, he's going to evidently try to play through this. You can do it, right? They'll put like a, almost like a cast on his thumb so it can't move anywhere. And they'll wrap it and all those things. But still just a different breed, man. I mean, you are throwing that hand, including that thumb, into 300-pound men who are violently running at you as hard as they can, and you're propelling that thing into them. And that's how he tore it in the first place. It's actually surprising me it doesn't happen more often, where you try to go to punch a guy, and the only thing that makes contact is the thumb. So then the thumb is the thing that has all of that all of that PSI, all of that force on it, and it just can't hold up. You know, your thumb is not designed to absorb or restrict that much force. Just like, by the way, your car is not designed to last forever unless you take care of it. I mean, that's why during fall car care month, you should show your car some love with help from AutoZone. Interior repair is more than just cosmetic. You can get the floor mats, replace mirrors, even tackling a heating system repair. It's about to get cold. I hope you have the heating system going. Any type of simple upgrades like seat covers can prevent spills, tears, rips, the UV rays from ruining your upholstery. That's important for resale value. Very important for resale value. AutoZone has more ways for you to get anything you need with the free next day delivery, free same day store pickup. This fall car care month, make AutoZone your one-stop car interior shop. They carry the best products from the best brands at the right price. Get in the zone, AutoZone. Need some shout outs, Bri? Every day, we got shout outs for our peeps. Pizza Boy Brewing, Sportaculture, Vision Comics with an X, HumanHeadNYC.com, SteakhouseSports.com. Yes, we did the College Draft Podcast yesterday already. And yes, we will do the Even Money Podcast later today. I think we're done here. Thanks for listening to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Make sure to also subscribe to the Fantasy Feast, Even Money, Business of Sports, and College Draft. All available at Apple Podcasts, RossTucker.com, or wherever podcasts can be found. A lot of times on the show, I mention DraftKings. Here's what you need to know. You got to be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 100Gambler or in Indiana, 109WITHIT. By the way, if what I was talking about included a deposit bonus, it doesn't always, sometimes it does. Deposit bonus requires 25 times playthrough, and deposit bonuses are paid out in site credit. 